All right. I'm so glad everybody's here tonight. Uh, I'm Drew Carter from the Office of Admissions of the Cross. Um, couldn't be more excited. First, I want to say, uh, as I've said many times already, congratulations on your acceptance. This was a, an incredibly competitive year in Holy Cross admission, and you should be so proud of your acceptance and so proud of, of having uh, persevered over the last 13 months. Um, you and your family should be so proud. So once again, congratulations. And thanks for coming to our, um, our webinar on the pre-law program, joined tonight by Professor Scott Sandstrom, and he's gonna um, talk us through a little bit of the pre-law program. Um, two quick side notes. Number one, closed captioning is available. Just click the little CC button down at the bottom. Also, um, please put your questions in Q&A. We would rather have this be more conversation than presentation. So put as many questions in as in the Q&A as you want, and I will, um, I'll be feeding those to Professor Sandstrom. And, um, and we're really happy you're here tonight. We'll, we'll hope to answer as many questions as possible. So um, Professor Sandstrom, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. And why don't you just give us a brief introduction uh, about, the, about yourself and about the pre-law program at Holy Cross. So I've been the pre-law advisor for 26 years. Um, I've been at Holy Cross for 36 years. Uh, my background is a bachelor's and a master's in accounting. I have a law degree. I graduated fifth in my class. Uh, I was gonna go into tax law. Uh, I am also a CPA. Uh, and so I, I'm one of the accounting professors here. Uh, and I started the trial teams that we have, a mock trial team, a moot court team, and now we have a mediation team that's award-winning. Um, so my background is in accounting and I also have a law degree. Um, Pre-law at Holy Cross is one of the bigger programs. So at one point we were the largest. Now I think we're, we're second uh, or maybe even third behind business. We put about 75 students a year in law school. Um, most of them Northeastern seaboard areas uh, from Washington DC to uh, uh, Boston, but we do have students that uh, go uh, back to where they came from uh, originally. And we have students who uh, go down to some of the southern states to start a career in a warmer climate. Um, we normally, uh, the, the, the biggest question that I get from students and parents about uh, what to do with, with pre-law is, what should I major in? And the first thing I want to mention to you is this, that unlike pre-med, uh, which uh, does not require you to major in anything, but they do have 10 required courses that you have to take. My son-in-law is a physician, a radiologist, actually, and one day I asked him what he majored in, expecting to hear the sciences, and he majored in English, and he went to the University of Michigan and has gone on to advanced degree. So, so it's, it's, it's not like that uh, in law school. You can major in any of our majors. We have actually had a, a law applicant and acceptance and matriculation from every major at the college, including some of the more unusual ones like music, uh, one of the foreign languages, or visual arts. Now, most of the students will come from the bigger majors at Holy Cross, political science, economics, psychology are the leading ones because they happen to be our largest majors. But I would not tell you to major in those for those reasons to get into law school. I would tell you to major in an area where you have an interest and an aptitude. Those are the two things that you really wanna target, an interest and an aptitude. Studies have shown that students will work harder and enjoy the learning process a lot better if they're in an area that they, that they, they find uh, uh, enjoyable or at least better than the others. That quite, quite frankly, I mean, studying and doing schoolwork is not at the top of the list of stuff that we would all do. We, we would all be going skiing or boating or, or doing fun things, watching the masters. Uh, but but uh, in terms of uh, uh, picking a major where you're going to have to take at least nine courses and maybe up to 16 in accounting and nine, I think, in economics is the smallest, is you certainly want to have an interest in the subject matter because you'll probably do better. Um, most of... Uh, um, in terms of placements, where do our students go to law school? Um, most of them are Eastern, Northeastern Seaboard, but we, but we put a lot of kids in a, a number of particular schools that have a Jesuit, uh, that have a Jesuit, uh, uh, um, uh, not a format, but a, a, a background. Notre Dame would be, or, or Catholic. Notre Dame is not Jesuit, but we put a number of kids in Notre Dame. We've had four or five this year was our probably our, our biggest record in terms of Boston College. It's a, it's a popular school with our students. We have eight matriculated to Boston College, probably five or six to BU. We always put a student or two into Harvard and some of the other big schools, and of course, Georgetown. So that's where our students end up going. Most of our students end up at pretty good law schools, uh, some of them outstanding law schools. The, the, the law, law as a profession now has changed an awful lot in the last 20, 25 years. 
uh, and where you go to law school is a lot more important now than it was, let's say, what back in the day, uh, because unlike physicians who all start at a high salary, we have a wide range of salaries uh, in starting. And the people that go to the go go to the better schools get the better jobs at a much higher rate. So it does pay to get into the best school that you can get into. In terms of programming, and then I'm going to stop uh, and, and, and field questions from you. I don't want to take up, up too much time. Uh, we have a set of trial teams at the college at the undergraduate level, moot court teams that were outstanding for a long time, a mock trial team, and an award-winning mediation team now. Um, and we also have an LSAT course. That's my job, is to, to set these programs up so that they're available to students. We have a professional who teaches our students how to do better on the LSAT course, and it's inexpensive. It's $500, uh, and it, we offer financial aid. And so this helps our students get higher scores. So everyone wins when the students are able to prepare on campus in Stein without uh, traveling off campus, especially in this environment. So, I mean, that's pretty much how the program is structured. Obviously in, in my situation, I sit down and meet with students for, with freshmen typically in a group setting, but now I'm meeting with the juniors. I had, I had Zoom sessions all day today. This is my sixth or seventh time on Zoom. I had six meetings today with uh, juniors mostly, going over what to expect and when to prepare for the LSAT, et cetera. This is an unusual year with the pandemic. Uh, normally I meet with parents and students live. Uh, this is a different, it's, it's the only way we can do it. So I think, Andrew, is, is that a pretty good summary? That's great. Um, just to speak to a few of the questions that we hear so often, um, you mentioned that it's really open for students to, to choose a major anyone that they're interested in, one that they have a passion in. Do you ever recommend specific courses to students who are thinking about applying to law school? Um, are there specific courses in the curriculum at Holy Cross that are a good preparation for law school? Um, well, look, I think certainly any course that, certainly any course that emphasizes a writing skills because lawyers, although we see them on television making presentations all the time, and the reality of of what lawyers do is much of it is writing and pre preparing and preparing for these talks. I think lawyers need to be good presenters. I mean, actually, that's what they are. They're advocates. They're advocates. So they need to be able to create uh, winning arguments and not necessarily in a trial setting, but they need to be able to convince other people that their way of viewing it is, is the better way to, to take a look at it. So I would always recommend them to take courses that would uh, improve their writing skills. Now, I, I think you know, Andrew, at, at Holy Cross, there's an enormous number of courses that if you, if you go to Holy Cross, you're going to write a lot of papers. Uh, I think the advantage of the trial teams is the fact that well, it's very hard to get criticism and improvement on oral presentations. They're, they're, and you get scoring on these trial teams where people say, the problem you did is you, you got off, a, you got astray, you didn't do this. You, it, it's, that's why I think the big advantage, and a lot of lawyers make their living, uh, um, uh, you know, vocally not just they, they, you know, making arguments uh, that are compelling ones. Um, the other types of courses I would say would be helpful would be, uh, lawyers need to understand sort of how things work, how things fit together, how, how, how governments work and how committees work and how things, how, are, are, how things fit together. I mean, they, they, things, lawyers have to solve problems that are not simple ones, they're complicated. And I think understanding sort of how the country works and how, uh, enterprises work, and, and I think that's important. So I think with courses, I, I but I, I, you know, I like to see a, 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 attorneys take a course in accounting. I like to see them take a course in history. I like to see them take a course in political science. And, you know, so I think if we run down the, the list of, of courses I would like to take, and I think a liberal arts education is, sets them up very well. And of course, I went to law school with a degree in accounting, and so I came from a specialty area. Uh, you know, law school's full of people that are in the sciences and all different other types. A lot of it, you know, we've had a lot of kids go into intellectual property out of the sciences, patents, you know, not uncommon. So that would be my answer. How about, um, you know, students regardless of their area of interest, whether it's in the sciences or in the humanities or for pre-law, um, we get a lot of questions these days asking about internships. Do you see um, Holy Cross pre-law students gravitating towards certain kind of internship opportunities that are available through Holy Cross, whether it's through the Career Center or through the summer internship program? Well, they certainly get a ton of internships at the college. I mean, there's, there's a wide range of them. And with, with respect to law internships, it's, 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 it's harder because 
there are law internships, but they go to students that are in law school and they're paid. And it's really a, it's really a, a, a preliminary uh, hiring. It's part of the hiring process. They've already decided that they'd like to hire this person. And so they bring them in for the summer and they pay them very well. And uh, then they make a decision as to whether they're going to hire them off of that. Most of them do get hired. And so it's almost like the accounting internships, very similar. Um, I think the internships that we do have at the college do work at law firms or they work at the, in, the, in the district attorney's office in Worcester. We've got a couple of kids there almost every year. But most of the work that they do is more like office work. They do office work or they t- write notes or they correct, uh, uh, they do, uh, um, you know, English corrections to memos. And it's, it's not high level work because they're not, they're not prepared. They don't, you know, they really haven't had courses in this type of stuff. So we don't, they're not as advanced as you would expect them to be. And, and neither are they in most other schools. Um, and how about the, the trial teams? I know those teams have been very successful at Holy Cross. Um, is there, I would imagine with success comes great interest. Um, are there a lot of Holy Cross students trying out for these teams? Is there, um, you know, do strong students have the opportunity to participate and others not? What's the, can you just talk about that process? Like as an incoming first year student, what would that be like for them to learn about those programs and to become involved? Um, well, I ran the teams for about 21 years. And when we, when I ran it, what we did is we had an opening meeting up in, in Hogan where we would invite all of the freshmen and sophomores, the upperclassmen all know. Uh, and then we would have a meeting and we would discuss how each of the teams work. So we have a mock trial team, which is very similar to what's a trial you would see on television with a judge and witnesses that are called. A case is released every year uh, in the middle of the summer. It's a criminal case one year and a civil case the next. Uh, and uh, an event has happened and you have maybe 150 pages worth of, of uh, evidence and witness testimony and pictures and, and uh, a, a weapon often a weapon or a video or a boom box that has the uh, a sound recorded of a car crashing and hitting a tree. And, and, and these are the piece. And then the students have now, the cases are evenly divided. If after, if after let's say half of the trial period, the uh, plaintiffs have won 75% of the cases, they'll introduce a new witness to balance the case. And so you compete against other schools. The New England region is the toughest. We were 8-0 twice. We won the New England region twice. We've sent teams to the Nationals eight times when I was running it. And uh, it's, it's highly competitive. I mean, if you're in this region, you know, we won. I, I had one of the administrators at the college say, you guys used to win all the time. What happened? And I said, hey, you know, we're competing against Harvard, Yale, Dartmouth, Brown, BC, BU, Tufts, MIT, Williams, Amherst. Did I get them all? I think there's 14 and they all have two teams. So we come in with our team and we're going to be very prepared, but we're not going to win it every year. And neither is Harvard and neither is Yale because they're, we're going to knock each other off. We're very good. Team. The way it works is you, you, in your first trial, you either go 2-0, and 1-1 oh, and one, or 0-2. Oh, and two. If you go 2-0, and oh, you then face another team that goes 2-0. and oh. And if you go 0-2, oh, you face a team that went 0-2. Oh, so the weaker teams play against the weaker teams and the top teams play against each other. It's called, it's tough. It's tough because if you win and go 2-0, oh, you're going to play four matches against really tough teams. It's, it's, uh, so it's, it's hard, but it's all, it's a, it's a, students learn how to prepare a case fully and what will sell to judges. And, and, and the whole fall is spent in invitationals. So it's typically uh, in New England, mostly from Boston. We've gone as far as Albany down to Yale. We've been to St. John's in New York, mostly. Uh, and then you compete against 24 teams uh, and then you're ranked, you know, and then you have all kinds of awards for best attorneys, best witnesses. Uh, so it's, it's a lot of fun. I, I thought mock trial was absolutely stupendous. Uh, moot court is different. There is no trial. It, it, it's appellate argument. It's appellate. And that's what they do mostly in law schools. Uh, that's the big one in law schools. Mock trial is the big one in, in undergrads. There's 800 schools doing this now, 800. Uh, and, uh, Moot court is growing. Uh, it's over 100 now. Um, the travel's better in moot court. I mean, I've been to California. I've been to Texas. I've been to Florida, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Orlando, uh, Minnesota. Uh, for, it, it travels a little bit better. In, in, it's airplanes. We get in airplanes and we, we compete. We've been the number one team with the number one student three times. And at a, when I finished, we had won 102 awards, 102 awards. 
74% of them were won by women students, female students. And, uh, and we, don't, we didn't preference anybody. I mean, it was a meritocracy. We didn't care if we, I didn't care if we won 102 with all women or all men. We're gonna go with the best ones that we've got. Uh, and the way those things work is you get a case and it's a constitutional case and it's got two main issues. So while mock trial is eight person teams with attorneys and witnesses and an independent judge, moot court is two person teams. And so you're up against another school. You never know who you're competing against. You're not allowed to show any type of school colors. You're disqualified if anybody mentions where they're from. You're not allowed to wear a school jacket. One of the funnier tournaments, Harvard showed up one year in maroon jackets. That's their school colors. And they had to wear their jackets inside out. They look like doofuses. Uh, but that's the way it is. In, in, in moot court, uh, you're going to give your presentation, then they give their presentation, and then you both pick apart uh, the, the arguments that the others made, and then you have a one-minute rebuttal, and there's a scoring sheet that has 400 points, and you're going to win. Now, the advantage of mock trial and moot court is the criticism you get from the judges, because while our students, I would say our students on average write about 40 papers, if you talk to them, 40 to 50 papers in their career here, big papers. These are not two pagers. These are papers, six pagers or more. Uh, you get a lot of criticism about your writing, but where do you get oral criticism in terms of when somebody says that that, that that was a very good presentation or that was a very poor one? You get it in these trial teams where judges say to, to students, you know, you lost your case when you did this, or you lost your case when you did that, or you did a tremendous job against this cross. And the kids learn how to cross-examine witnesses just like they're supposed to in mock trial. In, in moot court, the, the enemy is not the other team the judges are who you're combating with. You say good morning to these people and they say good morning to you. And then you face the judge, put your hands on the podium and deliver your argument and the judges interrupt you. And, and, and it's much like the Supreme Court hearings, that's what it's a takeoff on. And these, these deal with difficult issues. They're, they're not easy issues, uh, but the students prepare all semester for this. And then if you get a bid to the nationals, uh, about 80 teams go to the nationals, two, two person teams. We've had uh, three of the number one attorneys, and we've had twice our team has finished second. So we're right at the top there. We were a top seven school right out of the chute. Um, and Ed McDermott runs a mediation program that's smaller, but has done uh, remarkable in, their, in the years that they've uh, been competing the last three or four years. The nice thing about mediation is it's growing. And the second thing is the travel is unbelievable. They've, they've, they've actually won. They competed against law students and beat them. And then they go oh, international. They've been to Greece and Scotland. And, and I would say that's worth doing, just, to, just a chance to go to Scotland or Greece. That, that's pretty much it. That's kind of the program. And we do a lot of programming and then obviously meeting with the advisor myself. I sit down. I have sit downs with everybody. Let's see where you are. You know, where did you get on the outset? And then we provide the LSAT prep course to, to give them a chance. That runs in the spring and fall. Uh, and, uh, and we also have an online program that they have access to that's, that's for free. I do want to mention that next Sunday, we'll be holding a, a student club and activities virtual fair. And I expect that we'll have um, participation from many of our uh, student activities and clubs that are associated with um, some of our trial teams present. So students will be able to interact with current Holy Cross students who are involved with some of these programs next Sunday. Um, you talked about some of the travel for some of these competitions. Um, how does everybody afford that? Uh, the college has paid for it all from the very beginning. There's no costs involved. The students actually get a travel per diem. Uh, um, and early on, it was difficult. Um, you know, I don't want to say we took bagged lunch, bag lunches, but it, 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 it was pretty Spartan at the beginning. Uh, but I, I met, I met with the Boston college coaches who were fantastic, but the two guys that helped us out really got us going. And, and, uh, one of them, um, who's a big partner, one of the big law firms in Boston was one of the coaches. He said to me, Scott, if you want to solve your funding problems, winning solves everything. And I said, oh, really? And he said, just start winning and the alumni will get behind you. And, and that's what happened. We got 25,000 a year from Agnes Williams. And then that increased and then that morphed into something else. And, and I, I believe the college, I believe the teams now are endowed and uh, they have a, a much better budget than, 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 than I had. So they were able to compete at a high level. So there's no costs out of pocket other than spending money or pin money on trips. The kids get a per diem, uh, I don't know, $30 a day or something. We usually have a team dinner. 
Uh, so the travel, even the, even the airfare is all covered. Uh, so there's no out of pockets. The, the kids that are on aid compete just as, just the same way as the kids that, that, that could fund it themselves. So it's open to everybody. I, you know, you talk about winning teams. I was um, at an alumni event last year or two years ago now. And um, one of the, I think he was a senior who was a part of the, um, the court program, I think. Um, there was a, a question about athletics and winning teams. And he stood up and said, I'll tell you who the winningest team winning that always crosses is. is not. Well, the, the, the college did come out with, they came, I don't remember what year it was, maybe four years ago, five years ago, but they, they did list us as the winningest team in the last decade or something like that. And, 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 it's, uh, and, and we were on a good run there for a long time. We were, it was a, a lot of fun. Teams went to the nationals every year in moot court and mock trial is so much, it's more competitive because everybody's doing it. And the new England region is so tough. Uh, now um, moot court is getting the same way because now all the big dogs have moved in, you know, uh, mock trial was like that all the time when we got into it. I mean, you know, the, just to give you an idea who's winning now, uh, you know, it was Yale and Harvard one and two last year and Harvard and Yale the year before that. And so the days of, uh, some of the schools, you know, that, that uh, you know, mid-level schools that were dominated because they had great coaching and active students is over. Now it's, it's because if all things are equal, a team that's fully prepared, super well coached, and has really smart students is going to win almost all the time. And Harvard tried to have no coaches, and they got trashed for, for a decade. And now they have coaches like everybody else, and now they're at the top. And, and that's because, uh, you know, they've got an adult an adult running the show. And that's what you need. I wouldn't dream of sending 10 students on a road without an adult, you know. When do, um, when do students typically take the LSAT course? Well, I just was, I had, like I said, I had like six or seven meetings today. At the time to take it ideally is uh, your sixth semester. It's the spring of your junior year. And that's because uh, one, the students haven't taken a standardized test in three or four years it's since the SATs, right? And the second is this test is longer than the SATs. It's three and a half hours. And they're not used to sitting for three and a half hours. And, and the thirdly, it's against a much brighter group of students than taking the SATs. It's about the top quarter of kids in college at the better schools that are gonna go to law school. It, it's, it's, not, it's not a composite of who took the SATs. So it's not uncommon for a student, let's say, to be in the top 25% of their SATs and find out that they're in the middle of the LSAT. It's not because they have, have, have fallen behind. It's because at, at Holy Cross, if you took the whole class from top, top kid to the last kid who's going to graduate, it's really the top half of our class that has a shot at getting into law school and maybe the top 10% to med school. You know, that, that's, the, that's the reality of it. Um, so it, it's a tougher crowd and it's a tougher test. So I like to have them take it in the spring of their junior year because if they, if they, if they, if they didn't improve enough during, in the course, it still gives them the summer. And then they could, but if they wait till November of their senior year and it doesn't go well. The interesting thing that's happened to, you know, like I said, I've been doing this for, you know, close to 30 years now, is when, when, when I started, most kids went to law school right away. Uh, um, two thirds of them went right away. And that was, that was for almost 17 years, it was two thirds. Then we saw a shift after the collapse of the, of the law process in 2007, that big mess that we had that recession and, and law schools started struggling. And, and uh, after that, it, it shifted. More kids wait now because of the cost of law school. Law school went up 89% in one decade. And so because the costs went up and, 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 and the loans got bigger, I think people wait and, and, and measure whether they want to do this. So now, it, now what's happened is it's the other way around. One third go immediately and two thirds defer. Last year was a, an exceptionally odd year. We put about 70 kids in law school, 10 went right away and 60 did not. I think that's an outlier. I don't think that's going to happen again this year. With the pandemic, nobody knows really what's going on, but, but uh I did, most kids wait now. They take a year or two. Uh, and, I, and I don't think that's a bad idea. Um, med school, they, they're waiting too. You know, you have to work a year or two in a hospital or something like that. How does that overall number compare? Uh, to, I guess the question is how many kids are, how many Holy Cross kids are typically applying to law school every year? Uh, about, uh, I'd say between 70 and 80. 
and about 65 to 70 go. They're not all, not, not all of them didn't get in. A lot of them just decide where they got in wasn't, uh, you know, where they wanted to go. And so they all apply next year. Uh, with the pandemic, nobody really knows what's going on with, with and, we don't, and I'm sure you're facing it too, Andrew, with the, what the yield is, you know, what's going to happen, you know, how many, how many people got accepted, but then how many people are going to deposit, how many people are going to show up and, and, uh, and nobody really knows what that type of stuff. There is a little spillover this year because kids opted for a gap year after they got accepted and law schools usually don't carry over that, that over, but they did. Uh, kids did not want to take Zoom learning in law school. And so I expect it to be a little tougher to get into this year in law school, but nobody knows. Nobody really knows. The law schools haven't announced anything yet. They're all tied to the vest. How many um, times are Holy Cross kids taking the LSATs typically? You know, you mentioned starting early in junior year. Do you see, is it typical for kids to take it more than once? I would say half of them retake. Uh, half of them are, you know, half of them stick with their score because they did very well. Uh, or... Uh, they're afraid of going down of, of the number of students who change. And it's, it's surprising how many don't change and get the same score. It's not uncommon to see a kid get a one for the six and get a one for the six again. Uh, but of the kids that change, two thirds go up and one third goes down. So the, so the question is that statistically. So the question you have to ask the students, if they're going to think about retaking is, you want to know where they benchmarked at, you know, in the course. In other words, if, if they if they got a 160, they got a 160, a 158, a 160, and 160, and then they get a 160 on the test. If they take it again, they're probably not, you know, they, they got it about as good as they can get. Uh, a lot of times the kids nerve up, you know, and then that's, that's better because if you can control your nerves, then I think you can score a lot higher. I mean, a lot of the kids, this becomes like very, uh, you know, their life's work almost, and they're a failure if they don't really do well. And, and you have to really try to work with them on, you know, that's not really the case. You know, that we, we, what we want to do is be able to uh, get you to do as well as you possibly can. A lot of that's controlling your nerves and a lot of it's preparation. How, how prepared are you? And of course, a lot of it is, is ability. You know, all of those things factor. How, what is it like with when, when, you're, when students are applying to law school? Do they send all their LSAT scores? Do they only send their highest? I, I know what it's like for SATs, but... What's it like for LSAT scores? Well, your, your record includes all of them. You can't not have them show up. You have five days to cancel your score if you want to. Uh, so, um, and I advise students to cancel their scores if they nerved up or they blanked out on the test, um, um, you know, which, which happens. So if, you, if you've got 50 kids taking the test, there's going to be problems with five of them, I would say. You know, they're, they're, they're going to struggle. And, and, and uh, if they think they did bad, they usually did. But you don't get to peak and then make a decision if they see it, it's in. And even if the school decides that it will take the highest of the two you have, they have to report the average to the American Bar Association. So that hurts their numbers. And uh, Andrew, you work in admission, so you know that, you know, everybody says, well, we, we, we really don't worry about that, but you do, they do. Because in law school, if you, if you bring in a class, if, if an admissions group brings in a class, that says, uh, well, their grade point averages are lower and their LSAT scores are lower, but they're really nice students. Uh, they're gonna be in trouble, right? They're, they're gonna be in big trouble. They're, they're gonna have new people in there. So they're all worried about that stuff. So the law schools tell the students that. We, we have a law fair here every year, okay? So we have a law fair. Uh, this year it was actually uh, via Zoom, which was a first. You know, we, we, had, a, we, had, we had, I think, 59, 59 students attended it and, and 10 law schools attended it. But we have a live uh, a law fair in Hogan uh, with about eight or 10 schools. Fordham came from New York, the, the six Boston schools, BCBU, Suffolk, New England came, Yukon, uh, uh, and Iowa, <laughs> Iowa, uh, uh, and Seton Hall. And so we, we, we get 10 students and the kids get to answer questions. They give a presentation and then they get to, and I had cookies and Coca-Cola for everybody. And, uh, and it's about an hour and a half, 90 minutes. And the students are very comfortable asking admissions people that. And of course, if you have students, if you have schools from this range of, of uh, law schools, you know, they're not all top, they're not all at the very tippy top that we've sort of got to meet. Not every one of our students is going to go to the top school, right? They're going to, they're going to be spread out. And, uh, and, they, and the, and the, and the uh, admissions people are very candid. Uh, the one thing admissions people will never tell you is, will I get, will, will I get accepted with this? The students all go say, if I have a 3-4 and I get a 161, will I be accepted? 
and the law schools will always say we we we, we you know we can't say we, we can't say so can you, we, um, we, yeah go ahead can you tell me about um what kinds of students do you see involved not just with pre-law pre -law, but some of the um some of the trial teams like do you see uh, men and women do you see athletes and non-athletes do you see domestic international like what's the kind of the makeup of students that you're seeing involved with some of this i haven't even thought of that i i, I would say we're a real mix uh, you know i will say i will say this we've we've had uh i think we were the most diverse teams on campus i mean we had we had i had an um african-american captain we've had a, a um a Span hispanic captain We've had women captains. We've, we, it was always a meritocracy with us. Who's the who's the person most capable of leading the team? So I would say it's a pretty diverse group. Um, I would say um, they become very close friends. They're almost like if you if you have an alumni weekend, uh, the trial teams tend to come in groups, you know, because they were some of their closest friends. Because it is what I, the way I would describe the trial teams is it's an academic sport. It's an academic sport uh, where, where you're not, you're not um, blocking. I just had a big football player I was talking to this today. We're talking about football. And uh, and because uh, he had just been moved to defense, you know, and so he's a little upset. <laughs> he's moving to defense. Uh, it's an academic sport. You, you plan, you, you, you figure out ways to win, and then you have to adjust when things don't work out the way that you expect. Sometimes you're competing against the team you can see is clearly better than you, and you can beat them. And 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 you know that's it's a lot of fun doing that. Sometimes we lose when we think we ought to win. So I think it's it's a, it's an academic sport where there's a winner and a loser, and uh, and uh, and we're not going to win every year, uh, but we want to be competitive every year. I do think the skills that you learn are really really good in life. I, as I tell the students, even if you don't go to law school, the people who make out are people who convince other people that their way of doing things is right. I don't care if you're a manager and you have a group of people, you have to learn how to manage a group. And, and I think that really helps. Uh, it happens to be that it's particularly good for lawyers. And this is a structure. It's a big national organizations that run this stuff, that, to put, that cook up the cases and stuff. I was on the board of directors of Moot Court for five years. So I was one of the guys that was actually putting the cases together and picking the sites. I was the, the uh, coordinator that picked New Orleans. <laughs> One of the best. Good choice. If you've ever been to New Orleans, it's a nice place to go visit, you know, especially for college students. What about, um, so if, if uh, college students are not clerking for Supreme Court justices over their summers, do you have advice or what are you seeing some of the pre-law students do with their summers uh, while they're enrolled at Holy Cross? Well, when I would, you know, my brother-in-law is a big attorney up in Boston, and and uh, he works at Choate. Uh, Kevin Smart, he's a history major at Holy Cross. Just when I started, we never met, but and he told me you should always advise students to enjoy the summer and don't tell them to do legal work because they're going to be working real hard their whole lives. And he said, tell them to be a lifeguard, go to the Cape, enjoy the beach. And I don't think that's a bad thing. You know, I think that uh, most of the kids have summer jobs, but I don't think it's a healthy thing to. Uh, already start digging into that stuff because they just don't have the skills yet. Uh, you know, they just, they don't, you know, what are you going to do? An attorney going to say, write an affidavit? You know, uh, you know, these are people's, people's business contracts or, you know, it's serious stuff. So it's not like, I think, a lot of other things. I, the, the, the internships are huge, but they go to law students. Now you can be a law clerk and basically, you know, make copies of this, bring this down to the courthouse, you know, that type of stuff. But I would, I would not want to, I would not advise students to just start doing law stuff because it's, it's really office work. It's office work, proofreading, you know, that type of stuff. I'm just going to uh, give a quick reminder to the uh, attendees. Uh, put any last questions you have in the Q&A. I have just a few more questions. So last chance for questions, uh, put them in the Q&A. Um, what about, um, you, I, I've, I've heard our pre-law students sometimes talking about the speakers that come to campus. Um, can you speak a bit about that? Like who, whose ideas are, you know, who recruits the speakers to come to campus and, um, yeah, what's that experience like? Um, well, I usually contact alumni affairs when I need speakers that I don't know myself. Um, but we, we, I typically try to rotate them so we don't have the same type of speaker in every, every time. 
Um, my daughter-in-law is going to come in in this upcoming year. She's a prosecutor in Springfield, and she's uh, and so she's actually trying cases and has been promoted to director of violent crimes. It sounds terrible, but what it is is you know she's actually got the she's actually trying all these cases and they're murder cases and stuff. And you got to win those cases. So she's going to present a different type. So we have we have we'll have people that are prosecutors. We'll have people that are public defenders, and then we have people that are business attorneys. We had a, a senior partner from Chicago explained how everyone in his firm was evaluated, which was fantastic. I mean, it was an Excel spreadsheet that had 300 names in it. And, and they had all the attorneys billing rates and efficiency rates and everything. And I think everybody was astounded, including me, you know, that said, this is, this is the value of these people to our firm from a financial standpoint. Uh, so every speaker is a little bit different. We, you know, we've, I've had uh, uh, um, intellectual property speakers that have talked about patents, copyrights, and trademarks. Some of them are, are former students. I'm going to probably bring back a couple of the moot court people. Um, um, Chris, uh, Christine Feminari is, uh, is now clerking in, Bo in Boston, uh, working for a judge. Uh, and she's got a job at like Hale and Door or Ropes and Gray, one of those places. And, she, and she's going to come back and talk about that, what she's done. You know, the billable hours racket where, you you know, you work until seven, eight o'clock every night, and weekends, both days. And, you know, it's 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 uh, so we try to bring back all different types of people so that everybody gets a different look at it. I probably bring in a speaker or two every semester. This has been the odd semester off because I'm not a big fan of the Zoom stuff, but we're going to pick it up again next year. Uh, this is a question um, put forth by a student, an accepted student. I'm going to read it verbatim because um, it's so good and it uses great Je Jesuit terminology. Ah. So, Professor Sandstrom, what is your recommendation for students attempting to discern where they want to go to law school and which type of law they would like to practice? Oh, uh, how do you figure out what kind of law you want to practice? Well, first thing is you don't have to know when you go to law school. You can figure it out when you get there. Um, I would, what was the first question? The first question was, was like, you know, how do you- getting to school? Yeah, picking the school, out school. kind of law, yeah. Well, a lot of factors lend to picking a school, okay? Certainly one would be uh, how good is the school to begin with, right? I wouldn't care what state you were from. I'd say if you can get into Harvard or Yale, just go and don't think about it, right? Uh, but if you're not going to go to one of the elite schools, then other factors weigh in. Like it could be cost. The big state school may be well worth it. You can go to the University of Michigan for peanuts compared to what it would cost to go to some of these schools. So if you have a school like that and you're an in-state or that's a factor to consider. We don't have that in Massachusetts. We don't have a, a, a really high-end school that, 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 that we have UMass, but it's, it's, it's not like UConn or other schools like that. Um, but I would say um, in terms of where you're going to go to law school, a lot of it depends on your record. What does your record look like? You know, you know we, we put a list together of where you can probably get in and then you try to get a good fit. You know, where would you feel comfortable? Now, most law schools are located in big cities, the better ones, in big cities, where courthouses are. That's where law schools belong, near courthouses. Uh, so if you have a law school that's out in the country, it's, it's not going to offer you the type of internships and hands-on stuff that you could get if you were, let's, and the best place to go to law school, I think, for most places, people is, would be in Washington, D.C., you know, where, where you have so many internships that are so terrific. Uh, but normally, I ask students this. Where do you plan to live? Are, are you gonna Are you gonna stay where you are? I mean, where your folks live? Are you are, You know, are you where are you from? I'm from New Jersey. You're gonna stay in New Jersey. I don't know. Well, then, are you willing to move? Yes, I am. Well, okay. A lot of our students want to go to, to go to law school in Boston, and I think you know I I explain to students Boston's a young person city. It's it's a it's probably a good choice. So where would you fit in? What would be good? And I had a student I had met with three o'clock today, and I said, where are you going to move? He lives in Buffalo. The guy lives in Buffalo, and he said. Well, my parents are, want to move to North Carolina, and one of my other relatives has already moved to North Carolina, and so now I'm starting to think about it. So then I would say, okay, well, that makes it a little bit easier, because ideally, if, you're, if there's an advantage to going to a law school in the state that you're going to be practicing, uh, certainly if you move in. I mean, a lot of times, I, you know, in fact, I told that student, establish residency for one year, take a one-year gap year, and then apply as an instater, as an instater. You know, it's going to save you 50% of your loans. You know, take one year off and, 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 and move in. And, and, and that's what I'm, we're seeing a lot of our students do. There's a lot of really good schools. The University of Florida and tax, that's my background is in taxation. Florida is number two in the country in tax. And so if I, if, I was, if I was back to being 25 and broke, 
I would say, move down to Florida and, 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 and wait a year and then in, fly as an in-stater. And, and tuition is a third of the cost of out-of-staters. So that, those would be factors that I would weigh. And what, um, I mean, I know what undergraduate admissions offices look at um, when making decisions. Are law schools um, mostly just focusing on the student's college academic record, that their, their grades, GPA from college, and LSAT scores? Yeah, I would, that, that's, that's what they say are the primary, you know, the primary things that they look at. I mean, they, they all want well-rounded students that are outgoing and have many, many extracurricular activities. But I think they will not over, no amount of extracurricular activities, even if they're really solid, are going to overcome a weaker record. So you really need to focus on, on your, 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 your academic record of achievement, they call it. And that's not just what your grades are. I mean, uh, one, of the, one of the local state schools here, a uh, pre-law advisor asked me how many advisees I had. I said, I have 400. How many you put in law school here? I said, about 75. And he said, I won't put 75 in my career, in my career. I said, how many do you put in? Three a year. We're going to put in 75. And so uh, that, that would be my take on it. I, one of your questions was uh, earlier that I didn't answer would be uh, the, the student who, who asked the discerning question, you know, how do you figure out what kind of law you want to practice? Uh, you don't need to know that when you get into law school. I think it's helpful if you do, but we've had admissions directors say that it, most of the kids change anyway. Uh, my sister went, my sister's a law professor in Boston. She taught at Boston College for the last two years, and, and, and she's a law professor in Boston for over 30 years. And, uh, and, uh, you know, in terms of, in, in, I forget where I was going to go with that question. So I'm not used to teaching. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the, one of the, um, there's several Holy Cross alum uh, law school graduates in my family, most importantly, my brother. Um, and he turned out to start his own company and is not practicing law at all. But whenever a legal issue comes to the front, he is uh, well equipped and well prepared to, to meet that head on. Um, a lot, of, a lot of law students start in one area and end up in another. That's, that's what happens. I mean, I, I went into law school just for tax courses. That's all I wanted to take. Uh, and most people want nothing to do with tax courses. They find them miserable. But I found, you know, a lot of times, you know, you just pick your spots because, you know, it's a difficult area to do. And, and I was able to read tax statutes and understand, read cases, and it would, I, I could remember it three years later, where I couldn't do that, let's say, in other courses. And so for me, it was just really matching what I can do really well with a market for it. Because I think that's what it is. The secret with careers is to find something that you can do really well. Uh, if you enjoy it, the better. It's even better. Uh, but you need to find something that you can do really well and that there's a market for. If there's no market for it, I mean, look, you could be the world's greatest tiddlywinks player. You know, they're, they're the greatest. But there's, no, there's nothing to it. And you're not going to make a living out of it. You know, it's just a, it's just a hobby. So when you get to law school, you need to, you need to recognize that at the end of the day, you got to get good at something. The days of general practitioners as lawyers is pretty much over. Lawyers have specialty practices now. I mean, it's, we still have general doctors, you know, that you, you know, your family physician that can handle everything, but not in law so much. I mean, these big firms, they have estate and trust, they have tax, they've got family law, divorce, you know, and you become an expert at one area. Uh, and, and, uh, or, or several areas. Business lawyers would have a wider range. Uh, uh, but you're not going to come out. Uh, my, when I, in the town I grew up in, in New Jersey, Mr. Fullerton was our, our the town's attorney pretty much. And, and if you needed a will, you went to see Mr. Fullerton. And if you were getting divorced, you went to see Mr. Fullerton. And, and he just did kind of everything. And th th those days are over. They're only like in, in small Midwestern towns, you know, where you get sort of general information from an attorney. Around here, you know, you ask yourself, I'm, I'm buying a piece of property. Who handles property law? And that's what they do. And the next guy handles a lot of my, a lot of the uh, trial team, uh, you know, you're talking about speakers. I tap, I tap my graduates because a lot of them have become partners now. You know, Liz Crowley's a partner at Lev's Bernstein up in Boston. And so she's a family lawyer. So she handles divorces and adoptions uh, and, and immigration problems sometimes, you know, with family members. And so uh, they make effective speakers, but, um, most of the time, lawyers are dealing with difficult issues. You know, it's it's a it's a it's a it's not an easy way to make a living, but uh, but it's uh, I think you help a lot of people. I think a lot of lawyers get a bad rap. I mean, basically, what they're doing is they're trying to help people get out of problems that they have. I, I've got one last question, and it's a it's the money question, and that is, um, 
tell me, you know, all, if all our attendees here are either admitted students or their parents, and they are uh, likely weighing options between Holy Cross and other schools. Mm -hmm. And if they're in this session, they've, they've, they're thinking about the inevitability or the possibility of attending law school. Mm -hmm. um, it, can, can I hear your best pitch for why students should come to Holy Cross if they're uh, interested in the study of law and potentially maybe going on to law school? I would, I would say one of the things uh, that would be really helpful is the law schools know that the students that we have do very well in law school. That's what we hear from the law schools themselves. In other words, we, we've got a, a long track record of students who I believe, uh, whose academic record when they get in, uh, you wouldn't think that they would do as well as, we, we've had the number one kid at UConn like almost every other year. And you go, well, how is that possible? We're only putting four or five kids in. We had a couple of years where Billy Walker, the basketball player, was one of them. Uh, you know, we're, we're, they're the president of the Bar Association, as well as the number one kid in the class, is a different student. So I would say at a lot of schools, we, we have such a good record of, of what the kids do when they get there. I get, a, I, went, I get called, this is a good example, Lewis and Clark is on the West Coast of the na nation's number one environmental law school. And they invited me out with six other pre-law advisors. One was from Stanford and one was from Notre Dame. And I went out there and they said, the reason we have you out, I said, why do you have me here? And they said, we have two Holy Cross students at our campus. One is the number one student in the class. And the other is, is the, the, runs the, the uh, uh, law review, the law review chief. And so they said, both of these kids are at the very top of the, of the class in terms of grades. And, and we want you to send us more of them. You know, for us to send students to, to you know, to uh, Oregon, it, it, it's, it, we're not going to get many of them, right? But, but I, I think that's what our, I find that a lot of the schools, our kids outperform where you would expect them to perform. Well, thanks, uh, Professor Sandstrom. And thanks to all of our attendees. Know that this session will be um, archived and posted on our website, um, usually tomorrow by, uh, by noon, middle of the day. So if you have friends or family members who are not able to make it to tonight's session, it can be viewed on the Accepted Students website. Um, thanks so much for uh, all your questions tonight. If uh, your specific questions about um, mock trial or moot court weren't answered, know that uh, next week, next Sunday, 7 p.m. at our student activities virtual fair, we'll have current Holy Cross students there talking about their organizations and uh, you'll be able to get those questions answered then. So thanks so much for coming everybody tonight. Um, be safe and uh, be in touch. Good Thanks. luck with your choices. <laughs>